Hello, everybody from the ECA family. My name is Bruce Fredor, and I'm a partner at Gaining Edge. First of all, let me tell you what a great feeling it is to participate in this 59th ECA conference with you all. Many thanks to ECA for putting together this amazing conference in this innovative format that we, has brought us all together. And since I'm talking to you from Luxembourg, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate and to thank Business Events Luxembourg and all of its partners who have done a fantastic job in pulling together this European hub. We've talked a lot over the last few days about COVID-19. And because through the ECA Congress, we've been networking all around the world, we realize that what really matters now is who you ask and where they live when you talk about COVID-19, and perhaps even more than ever before. Some parts of the world have gotten the coronavirus more under control than others. But hotspots continue to emerge and to re-emerge with restrictions lifted and then reinforced to try to slow down the virus's spread. We've all been in various stages of lockdown over the last few months, and we're coming to terms with living in a new world order in which the return of regular travel and face-to-face -face meetings is going to take much longer than we originally intended, we originally imagined. So what have we learned during this time? Well, first of all, we hope that we've learned about compassion. Compassion for those who have succumbed to the virus. Their lives will never be replaced. Others have lost their, lost their livelihoods to the economic fallout from the pandemic, which in itself is a tragedy of another kind. We read every day about the statistics and the toll of human life and on the economy. The statistics we have in front of us are mind-boggling, and we struggle every day to come to terms with their magnitude. But at the same time, we can't let ourselves become, become so consumed with what's been taken away from us that we fail to see what, what's been left behind. As we've been talking about over the last few days, we need to take this crisis by the horns and realize that if we work together as an industry, if we collaborate, we have the power to make changes for the better. What's at the heart of the business events industry? Bringing diverse people together, fostering communities, making connections, raising awareness and consciousness, sharing knowledge, and moving our societies forward is really what's important now and even more important than ever before. But what we need to do is think about it and do it in a different manner. So with that in mind, we thought it would be interesting to bring together speakers representing three different sectors of the business events industry and ask them to explain the lessons they've learned during the COVID-19 crisis and how they are using those lessons to define actions to help them, their organizations, and their sectors to prepare for the future. So I'd like to introduce the three panelists who will be with us today that we brought together for this session. First, let me welcome Nick Dugdale-Moore, the regional manager of Europe from UFI. From the very outset of the crisis, UFI has taken a leadership role in developing effective strategies aimed at helping the exhibition sector adapt to the conditions imposed by the pandemic. Secondly, we're joined by Remy Merckx, Senior Vice President for Marketing and Digital at the Radisson Hotel Group. As we know, the hotel industry has been heavily hit, hard hit by the crisis. And Remy will tell us how the Radisson Group is developing new digital approaches to sales and marketing that will enable them to prepare a sustainable future. And lastly, it's a great pleasure to welcome our good friend Carlotta Ferrari from the Florence Convention Bureau. From the vantage point of a Convention and Visitors Bureau, Carlotta will describe what innovative approaches she and her team have been working on over the last few, uh, last few months to develop a bright future for Florence as a business events destination. Now, I just want to let you to tell you about the format of our session. What we're going to do is let each of the three speakers make a short presentation. And after they, the three of them have finished, we'll have time for a Q&A session. So what I'd like to ask you to do is, as you're listening to the different presentations, is to make or is to pose your questions or make comments 
on the ECA platform that you have in front of you, which we'll receive here on stage, and then we'll be able to have a very interactive Q&A session once we finished with the presentations. So with that introduction over, I'd like to, to give the floor to our friend, Nick from UFI. Nick, welcome to you. Thank you, Bruce. Hi, everybody. And first, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Ica, for the very kind invitation. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in Luxembourg. Uh, obviously, I'd very much like to. Um, this is my first Ica Congress. Um, over the years, you know, every, people have said that the ICA Congress is similar to the UFI Congress, uh, except a lot more fun. So, yeah, I'm sad not to be able to experience a real ICA Congress, but certainly next year. So, yeah, I've got 10 minutes today. Uh, I'm going to try and keep on time to talk about um, business events as we see them. So, next slide, please, um, Benoit. To start off with, I'll try and give you um, a very brief three-minute version of the status of the global exhibition industry. Slide, please. So when I talk UFI, we are the global association of the exhibition industry. So our members are principally 70% exhibition organizers and venues. Um, now, our, so when I talk about exhibitions or trade shows, I mean B2B trade exhibitions. Of course, our, org, our, our members organize other types of events, B2C shows, etc., conferences, and our member venues host all types of um, events in their venues. But this is, this is the, the industry we represent. So, of course, firstly, to talk about the damage done to our industry, um, it, uh, there's some sound coming from the studio. If somebody could mute that, please. That'd be great. So it, these, these were figures just till July. And of course, like many industries that are forced to close down from March onwards globally, um, directly, it's easy to measure the, the impact. And, and you can see here it was 158 billion uh, euros up until July. And of course, we're now looking to the end of the year and beyond, beyond that figure will, will massively grow. But more importantly is the second figure, which is the value of business that is not conducted because our events can't take place. So, you know, exhibitions and all types of business events, be they conferences, trade shows or whatever, you know, th these are important to serve the underlying industry of that community. So if our events can't take place, you know, those deals aren't made, those connections aren't made, those businesses aren't developed. And this is a really important factor when talking to our governments about how we are not part of the problem, we are part of the solution. Next slide, please. So from the UFI side of things, next slide. So, so one of the first things we did back in May was to produce a very simple framework document. Go back a slide, please. Um, a, a framework document which showed that talking to policymakers and governments that exhibitions and business events are not mass gatherings. In many parts of the world, under WHO terms, and still here in the UK, exhibitions are qualified the same as Glastonbury Festival or a pop concert or whatever, which clearly we are not. So it's important to make that distinction. And the German government adopted that early on in May. Secondarily, um, we built the framework, next slide, which we enhanced upon working with ICA and AIPC to look at the different protocols. Everybody was looking at um, what protocols can we run our conference or our event? And most of the stuff is the same, it's common sense. So, so we put this together um, and updated it in September. And here you can see uh, about a dozen case studies of shows, of exhibitions that took place um, from July onwards under new um, COVID protocols. Because of course it depends you know, where you are in the world, what your government, whether that's a per square meter, a volume density issue, or whether it's a two meter. So everybody has their own regulations, but there are a ton of examples you can see in this document of how you can operate your event in this environment. Next slide, please. Also, we have a lots of um, examples of best practice uh, of again of events that took place um, since since the, since the lockdown and since we've come out and started emerging. So I can't see my slides at all now. But one of them was Caravan Salon in Dusseldorf, which was a B two B B two C show, um, which welcomed one hundred and seven thousand people um, over uh, ten days in Dusseldorf. And another one was um, Lux Expo the Box. And I know you had one of your speakers yesterday, Tara. So in Luxembourg, the, um, the, the regulation said no indoor events. So they've moved their event outside on the roof, which is a, you know, a beautiful solution. We as event organizers are inherently innovative and are problem solvers. So again, you know, in the COVID sense, whatever the regulations are, we will adapt our events accordingly. Next slide, please. 
Finally, if you want to track um, where different countries are in the world, where different markets are in terms of their reopening, we have this kind of easy to, hopefully easy to understand market tracker uh, on our website where you can see you know, what the different um, regulations are for being able to operate events. Um, so this, all of this stuff is at ufi.org slash coronavirus. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, as, as Bruce mentioned, you know, getting the green light to open was, was only the first hurdle. We thought that was it, you know, and when in Germany in May, they said they gave the green light to open s some exhibitions, some of the large autumn trade shows said, right, we're off. But obviously that wasn't, um, you know, that wasn't the case. If, if we can go to the next slide, you know, we can see that, but, you know, what do visitors and exhibitors want to come back right now? Um, and can digital replace? So on the first of those questions, do they want to come back? Well, I mean, first of all, they weren't able to come back because of the travel restrictions and the quarantine restrictions um, Bruce um, mentioned to. But in terms of do they want to, look, we're doing this event digitally. There was a pivot to Zoom. Everybody's kind of bored of Zoom now, but that's how we're forced to live and to conduct all of our work and business. Next slide, please. So we, we, we just we did a study, we do a lot of research. Um, we did the next, this piece of Global Recovery Insights. We talked to 9,000 visitors and exhibitors, uh, I think in about 50 countries, um, to look at you know, how they saw things coming out. Next slide, please. So great, good news for us. We honestly didn't know what the re results would be, but exhibitors, you know, the spot, the, 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 well, I mean, exhibitors rated live way more highly across all aspects. So the light blue is they preferred live events much better and the dark blue a little bit better. So quality of networking, overall experience, generating sales, representing your brand and return of investment, live still remains way better. Next slide. From the visitor's point of view, it's the same. So the top one's quality of networking, overall enjoyment, doing business, finding new suppliers, uh, getting new ideas and inspiration. Again, live still way better. Um, I guess the next one down to content, you know, certainly content, we're all getting used to being delivered content digitally. Um, so, and we've seen virtual summits or virtual or digital conferences, you know, that can take place. But at the end of the day, to transact, to do business, and if you're demonstrating products in an exhibitor sense, and we've long since talked about, you know, needing the five senses, um, nobody has really cracked exhibitions digitally yet. Next slide. So again, and the most poorly served is networking. And that's a fundamental part, not just exhibitions, but any business event is the fact that we actually come together because it's not just, you know, in the coffee breaks, but it's the serendipitous meeting, you know, in the bar or wherever on the tour, at the city tour, that these the networks and friendships are developed which are really poorly served by digital events. Next slide. So in terms of budgets, this looks at when most uh, exhibitors would imagine their budgets come back. Um, and again, thankfully only 12% said they can't imagine coming back to live ever. Um, a chunk of it, 28% said as soon as the trade show starts. So this pivot to virtual, thankfully at the moment, it seems it's more of a bridge to when we can get back meeting together live, which is the core of all of our businesses. Next slide, please. Um, now, the reasons why visitors might attend less in the future, I mean, as you understandable in this in this environment, almost 70 percent safety concerns and travel restrictions. Next slide, because again, as, as Benoit mentioned, rebooting international travel is key to the recovery of our exhibitions and business events. Next slide, please. And in this sense, you know, we're very much wedded to the futures of other industries. So uh, international travel, airlines, hotels, um, you know, our, our next speaker. Um, all of these industries, if we cannot get, people are not going to get on a plane uh, like I can't come to Luxembourg if I'm not sure if I have to quarantine either side. It's not going to happen. So, you know, the, the vaccine could be months, if not years away. We put out a position. We support uh, rapid testing over quarantine. And you can see on the right, the WTTC, um, Gloria Guevara hosted a, a, a G20 Tourism and Travel Minister's Summit a couple of weeks ago, supporting the, the same policy. And she's actually speaking at our Congress in a couple of weeks. But you know, we, our, our fates are very much wedded to the international um, conference, but, but, you know, the airlines, the hotels, and these are huge sectors. I'm an optimist. I cannot believe that we cannot, that this solution, uh, this situation can carry on for three or six more months. You know, so many huge industries would be devastated. I'm confident and hopeful of a solution to that in the coming weeks and months. Next slide, please. So the future, just to sum up, and the next slide. Um, 
that we have not seen any evidence of a fundamental shift away from live events. And this is looking at the digital side. I mean, we could talk about this and we have data. We could fill a whole hour talking about digital and virtual, virtual or hybrid events. But fundamentally, um, right now, you know, the future is in our hands. We have the trusted brands. Uh, our, our, our events, you know, offer business returns and business uh, value that cannot be got digitally. Um, the timeline to restart business depends on external factors, for example, the international travel restrictions um, and the regulations in the country. And I can't see what the last one was. <laughs> if we could go back, of course, in the post-COVID world, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, whatever the regulations are in that given market, we will adapt. We've always done that. You know, if we have to use masks, we'll use masks. If we have to use distancing or uh, you know, density as a method, we will do that. We will adapt our events, you know, as we come on. Um, just to the last slide, just to say, because I have 30 seconds left, um, that one thing, it, it, it is the awful human cost, the terrible situation we find ourselves in. We're one of the very few industries that's still mandated closed in many parts of the world. Um, but I like to tell the story of the uh, Persian Sufi poet uh, and, the, and the king, you know, said that he wanted to have a gold ring inscribed with an inscription that would be true for all of the ages. And none of his wise men could, could come up with anything that pleased him till an old wandering sage came who had experienced much. And he said, this too shall pass. So again, you know, this too will pass. You know, I look forward to next year, hopefully meeting you in person uh, and we can be looked back on the lessons of this. But in the meantime, very ha happy to talk more. Please contact me, nick at ufi.org. Uh, and to, to continue the discussion. Thank you. That, many thanks, Nick. Thank you for that. It's really interesting, I think, for, this, for the Eco family to get the, the point of view of the <laughs> exhibition industry. That's why we wanted to hear from you, and we look forward to having a discussion with you and the others later on when we finished the second. So I'd like now to introduce Remy Merckx, who's talking to us from Brussels. Uh, Remy is going to talk to us about what's going on at Radisson Hotels and how they're preparing the future um, for the, a brighter future for the hotel, the, their hotel group. Remy, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, uh, Ika, for the invitation today. I'm very honored to be uh, on the floor. Uh, unfortunately, like many others, uh, we are stuck at home and we cannot move for the time being. But like Nick, we would like to be very uh, positive uh, in our minds and also in our acts on what we are doing towards our future customers to bring them back in our hotels, to bring them back and organizing their meetings and their events, because that will happen. Um, and we all feel the longer the situation will, will go on, of course, um, it's going to be very hard to recover. And the work that is ahead of us is huge to find new ways of working and new ways of attracting people into our destinations and into our hotels. But we will get there and it will also, and I will explain what we did at Radisson Hotel Group, it will also help us to do it differently. Going back to what and where the past was is not an option and definitely not for the hospitality industry and for the hotel industry. Next slide, please. Just um, to give a quick reminder, very clear uh, numbers here. 30% was uh, our pre-COVID meeting and events share of our total business at Radisson Hotel Group on a global basis. As you can imagine, um, this from one day to another, really from one day to another, has dropped significantly close to zero. Um, we have now recaptured a little bit of our business, but we are today at 2% of that total volume of business that we have lost. So as you can imagine, this is way, way, way ahead of us uh, in order to recover, and we have a lot of work to do um, in, or, in order to, uh, to organize that. And obviously, as you can imagine also, uh, hotel businesses is not only related to meetings and events. It's a big part of our business, especially for the big chains like Radisson and, and some others of our competitors. Um, but it's only a part of our business. Unfortunately, the rest of our business uh, being the leisure business or the corporate business has also completely crashed um, as we speak uh, because of the crisis. So we have a double or triple challenge in the hospitality industry is to recapture all that level of business and to, uh, uh, and to decide how we will do that in, in the future. Next slide, please. So we had to react very, very quickly and the agility was a key element of our recovery plan. And we did, after only three weeks 
after um, uh, the first closure of our hotels, we introduced into the market our new safety protocols. We decided to go in partnership with a company called SGS, and we revamped completely and we created completely new safety protocols that we launch in a very transparent uh, way in all our operations. And those protocols apply to our three main businesses in all the hotels um, that we are running. In our rooms, of course, which is uh, uh, the majority of our business, in our meetings and events. So we have created specific protocols for meetings and events and also for a smaller part of our business, but very important, which is the FN, FNB or FND for all food and, 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 and restaurants, um, also introducing specific protocols. This was a key element uh, for us to go back to the market to say, you know why, you know what, whenever we will be ready to welcome you or whenever you will be ready to travel again, we will welcome you in a very safe environment with guaranteed capacities and guaranteed protocols in order to make your stay as safe as possible in all our hotels. Let's watch a little video to introduce you with our safety protocols. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has fundamentally changed the way we live and redefined the way we travel. At Radisson Hotels, health, safety and security worldwide is one of our top priorities. That's why we have thoroughly reviewed all processes and enhanced our procedures, creating an in-depth cleanliness and disinfection safety protocol in partnership with the worldwide leader in health and safety, SGS, to ensure guests' confidence and peace of mind from check-in to check-out. To meet new health and safety challenges, our guidelines include increasing cleaning and disinfection frequency, paying special attention to high-touch points, providing hand sanitizing stations throughout the hotel, using personal protective equipment and protective screens, implementing social distancing measures in public areas, respecting strict food safety procedures, and providing options for... Okay, I apologize. I think we lost um, we lost the audio of the video. Um, I'm, I'm sure you will be able to find uh, that video on our Radisson Hotel Group uh, YouTube channel. So, what I wanted to spend a little bit more time uh, for you, of course, I, can can we come back one slide, please? We go back on the slide, please. Okay, Rem, we don't have another one, Remy, so that's okay, it. Okay, I, I was missing, I'm, I'm missing one slide. That's fine, no problem. So what, what we did, we created before, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining the new um, uh, sales and marketing methods and technology. We have launched also new products. Also very quickly in the crisis, we launched hybrid rooms and hybrid meetings. We want to, we, we, um, uh, we asked the questions to all our uh, meeting bookers, to 3,000 uh, meeting bookers around the world, on how they would envisage uh, the quickest solution to bring back some meetings on the markets. And we created the hybrid meetings, which allows also a uh, global organization to organize very localized meetings in our hotels. And uh, the world can uh, log in as we do today for this uh, global meeting uh, from uh, all uh, other places in the world. That's, that's what we have done and we are launching now this product uh, to the meeting and events community through our sales and marketing ca capabilities. Now, let's spend uh, uh, the, last, uh, uh, the last point, which is very important for, uh, uh, for us, is that we took this crisis also as an opportunity to reshift completely and to um, uh, relaunch completely the way we were doing our sales and marketing around meetings and events. Also, actually true for our other businesses being, uh, being our hotel rooms. Uh, but for meeting and events, it was a key element that we were missing a lot of digitalization and digital processes uh, to reply to RFPs and to respond to customers' requests and also to come up, uh, uh, to come up with um, uh, a, a, a proper online capacity to book meetings and events. So we, uh, we created in the sales and marketing team, we did a, a complete audit of our uh, ad tech and martech 
uh, allowing us to be way more technological in the way we were pushing our products and our services to, uh, to our customers. We created four uh, uh, pillars that allows us uh, to, uh, to become more efficient. One is we have finally engaged our marketing activities to artificial uh, intelligence. We are collaborating in, into this with our digital uh, uh, marketing agency, uh, which is Accenture Interactive, not to name them, um, in helping us to understand how artificial intelligence are able to help us to know better our customers. And also taking the past data that we had from our customers in order to know them better and to serve them better for, uh, for the future. And we have created a value-based consumer and also employees in order to enhance this capacity of using artificial intelligence to serve a better uh, uh, product to our, to our customers. Obviously, this is all related to data. So we decided also uh, to come up with a new data center uh, uh, in order to collect all the data from our customers, uh, being meeting and events customers, but also hotel rooms uh, customer, so that we can address them in, in a way better, uh, uh, efficient way. Um, we came up, very important uh, matter moving forward, it's the automation and the personalization of our marketing activities. Um, we reviewed completely our back and front office processes related to marketing campaigns and marketing uh, 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 activities. And we came up with a lot of automation and a lot of personalization. So we created the systems that allows to automate uh, uh, the way we are addressing the products and the service to our customers. We have now across the board, across all our hotels worldwide, we have more than <clears throat> 2.5 million personalized messages that are going out uh, to uh, potential uh, future or existing customers in order to incentivize and to tell them our stories on how we will, we will build back our, our business uh, with them. Of course, what is also very important, specifically during the crisis, is our hyper-local operations. Uh, we need, we are global companies and we are global brands, but at the end, we have people going to local operations, to local hotels, to local destinations. And this has been a really huge trend in, uh, uh, during the crisis, and we are going to develop that trend even further so that we can offer and distinguish and differentiate all our products from one location to another to fit with the local market uh, uh, capabilities. And that will increase significantly also the customer engagement we are having with all our existing or potential new customers. The last uh, 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 big audit we did is our innovations and our technologic innovations. And we are moving more and more all our technology uh, to the cloud, uh, to cloud native technologies. So this is a huge pro, uh, 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 progress and process that we are putting together. What has been good during the crisis is that we decided also to keep our investment in technology. We decided not to cut that investment. We cut a lot of other uh, budgets and a lot of investment, but we continue to invest on building a better technology um, that will be able to cope with the future, with future development uh, in a very agile way. And of course, we do that through very strong partnerships with technology company. We are not building this technology anymore in-house, which the hotel industry has done for the last 50 years. Building in-house technology is not good for the future. Um, and we have outsourced a lot of that technology to allow more agility. That's how we are changing our um, uh, sales and marketing moving forward. Uh, hoping that it will make it way more efficient and the return on investment will be even bigger uh, uh, for our company. So in a nutshell, new business models, new ways of working, and we allow ourselves also in the future to hire new talent. It's very important that we go outside of the industry to bring technology, digital native talent into our organizations because that's what our customers are expecting from us. Next slide, right. please. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Remy, thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting. Very interesting point of view. Uh, I like the idea of the global innovation with the local applications. I think that's very, very important in, in, in the hospitality industry. So thank you. We'll come back to you. So I'd like now to, to pass the floor to Carlotta, who's calling us from Florence. Hello, Carlotta. I hope everything's all right with Hello. you in Florence. 
Good to see you. Yes, good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon, Anita friends. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, so it's so sad, to be honest, to be here because I love to attend the ICA Congress. I was supposed to be in Luxembourg, but uh, unfortunately, I've just finished my quarantine. Luckily, I'm negative, but still here anyway. So thank you, uh, ICA, and thank you, Bruce, for inviting me uh, for this panel. I will give, of course, my point of view, so the point of view of... Uh, a destination, which is, of course, different from the one uh, my colleagues just explained to us. So next. Uh, again, and quickly, I'm Carlotta. I have the privilege to run a private CDB with over 300 members. We are the official partner of the municipality with three divisions dedicated to leisure, nice, and destination weddings. Next. I am also the uh, proud president of the Italian Convention Bureau, again, a private company representing more than 3,500 companies uh, um, in Italy and partner of the Italian Tourist Board and, of course, member of the European Alliance of Nations of Convention Bureau. Next. So, to start. You know, when you work in a, in a convention bureau, uh, you are mainly a problem solver in your life. You have immediate reaction. You used to manage a complicated situation coming from members, mayors, clients. So uh, we used to be very reactive. And this is what we did in March after, of course, the shock when everything started. Uh, our immediate reaction, maybe as most of you, was started to solve contingent problems, so employees at home, budget issues, contract to cancel, and uh, to find, of course, communication strategies to say that uh, we are fine, we will soon be better, we are going on, and of course, organizing hundreds and hundreds of uh, webinars for our members and for the industry. We were really all focused on the short term because, of course, we have been invested by a situation uh, never seen before. Uh, next. From the... Um, next, please. Next from the business From the business development side, um, our short-term solution has been starting to work on a national level. We have worked on a sort of ICA, Italian database of associations together with the Convention Bureau Italia. We have finalized a specific convention plan for a national association in order to support them from the very beginning and to give them all the possible city benefits and flexibility, of course. And uh, next, please. But we had to stop planning in a short term because the short term was not an option anymore. Next. In March, we were, maybe we were not conscious yet about the future, the real future and the situation. So we were planning for June, and then in April, we started planning for July, and then maybe September. So now it's November, and I'm here in Florence attending the ICA Congress. So we have decided, next please, to change uh, perspective and we have started, and most of us, most of our st uh, staff, started to concentrate only to the future. And a not so far future, finally, for a convention bureau, but for sure a future without COVID-19. So at that point, we have decided to optimize the time we had at disposal and to explore all the possibility for a future growth setting realistic business goals. So we are trying to understand better and deeply who we are and to know better where we want to go in the future. So Florence is a very popular destination. We are well known all over the world, especially as a leisure destination with a good reputation and amazing numbers pre-COVID, of course. And um, finding the good balance between all this and the mice industry and defining more precisely the, the number of association meetings we want, the kind of association we want to grow in Florence with us has been our mission from that uh, period. 
And in all this process, uh, the very important thing we have done has been involving our member, involving the industry and our stakeholders, because in a very dark period as this one, it's very important to work together on positive projects and concrete things. Next, please. The first thing we have done uh, has been working with uh, Gaining Edge on the competitive index study for Florence. Um, the, the aim was to identify the real competitive set. Um, our current position as a destination for international meetings and to set achievable business goals in the post-crisis period. So to set us a, a list of concrete action to restart the business and especially to have the best possible position in the association meetings market when we will be out from this situation. Next, please. In terms of uh, product overview, Florence has been evaluated uh, based on the quality of the products for international uh, meetings, of course. Um, the product overview has been based on 30 points important to international meeting planners. And we have identified the eight uh, destination competitors, uh, evaluated, of course, among the same criteria to define our gaps and our advantages, of course. And we have worked on a fair share analysis in order to assess our own past market performance and as well for setting future goals and measuring future performances, always um, against other cities uh, with the same set, within the same set. Um, the output, next please. Uh, of course, we had a, okay, thank you, a very interesting outputs. Uh, first of all, in terms of intellectual engagement, we have deeply, we have decided to deeply analyze uh, the potential of our local leaders and also the effectiveness of our ambassador program. So we have focused, to, we have focused on a in-depth research of the local leaders, not only to develop business, but also to support local association leaders to increase their visibility at an international level and to position our city um, as a business and scientific hub. Uh, you know, this is also connected with a destination branding because everybody knows Florence in the world is very popular as a leisure destination, but maybe we need to improve our position and perce perception as a scientific hub. And of course, now we know better and better what we have improved have to improve in our product. And this is more difficult because it's, it's not depending on us because we are talking about some uh, infrastructures. Uh, next, please. Um, actions. What, so what we are doing right now, we are improving our association program. Of course, we have our ambassador program maybe since we exist. Um, but we have used these months to uh, sign a formal agreement with the university, which is in Italy a totally public, public entity. Um, we have been maybe a little bit stalker with them, but we have definitely opt optimized our time. Uh, you know, in this period, I found that people are more used to listen, to find solutions, to solve problems. Um, and the formal agreement is mainly to manage university events, um, to uh, develop and develop our ambassador program. But now we are also working on the attraction of specific associations in order to establish sort of a center of excellencies or to participate, let them participate in uh, scientific projects here in, in Florence. So we want to support more and more um, the growth of association market and uh, our local leaders in increasing the visibility and reputation at an international level. Next. Of course, we are uh, working on the business development a lot for uh, the attractions of uh, international uh, congresses. Normally in Florence, we used to present about 40 bids per year. But now, together with Gaming Edge, we have developed um, criteria to better qualify and prioritize leads that best suits for Florence capacity and our uh, industry. 
we have identified the number of um, international meetings that we won for the next five years. And now I can say that we better know the balance between corporate events, national events, and international events that we want to have in Florence. And we have moved more human resources, of course, of the office to this project, especially from the operation side, which is quite uh, flat at the moment. Next, we have improved our uh, subvention plan for international associations. So we have launched a new one a couple of years ago. So we have improved um, to be more and more attractive for international meetings and to establish long-term relationship with our clients. And um, next, uh, we have worked a lot with our members to do this. So this is the advantage to be a, a private convention bureau. For us, the easiest thing is to talk to the industry and to uh, all the supply chain. Uh, we have worked on, of course, hotels rate, hotels conditions, hard off pricing policies at the Congress Center, magnificent venue. Uh, but of course, I can't tell you more about it. So uh, next, please. And I'm going to the end and just to say what we learned. We learned, first of all, that planning a future and concrete things helps to overcome panic. So it's been really important for us in the relationship, for the relationship with our members, but also for our team to work on positive projects and concrete projects to realize after uh, coronavirus. And at the same time, this supported us in taking care daily of our members because we talk to them every day, finding new solution, uh, suggesting new uh, kind of contracts to apply. And of course, we have supported them also in um, all the requests they have uh, for our government, for the recovery plan, et cetera. Next, please. Uh, ah, and also finally, the short-term plans uh, have been useful because not now, but not, of course now everything is closed. But uh, as soon as we'll be out from this situation, we have a, a extraordinary plan for Italian uh, associations and corporates to launch. And so uh, we didn't waste our time anyway. And our final suggestion is always to optimize your time to realize fast. We represent many companies. We represent an, an entire supply chain. We are at the same time partner of the local institution. And we have always to be ready to change and to be faster than them. Of course, to be faster than the institution is quite easy, especially, especially in Italy. So as a convention bureau, you always have to have the ability to change strategies, to readapt, and to be always ready to different situation. We do this normally because this is our job. We usually don't crack under pressure and we have to do even more now. Next, thank you very much. And stay positive, negative, negative. Stay absolutely negative. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Carlotto. Great. Thank you all three of you for those excellent presentations. Very interesting. I want to, we, just, we want to have a, a, just a quick, we don't have a lot of time left, but we have a couple of questions that have come in. And one of them that I think is really interesting is related to um, how, you're, how you're working with your staffs, your internal staffs. One of the, you've all talked about the transformations that need to take place if we're going to succeed in the future. Um, that requires that we have our, staff, our staffs that can follow us in these transformational periods we're going through and we're gonna, which is gonna become even more accelerated as time goes on. Can you tell us a little bit, uh, maybe I'll start with Remy, can you tell us a little bit about what Radisson is doing in terms of training your staff to make sure that they're up to speed in implementing the, the kinds of digital transformation that you mentioned in your presentation? Sure, Bruce. This is a very important part of our digital transformation indeed. Um, we have actually launched in most of our hotels uh, internal app um, that allow all operations area, including all meeting and events, uh, staff to work in a way more efficient way and measuring also all uh, 
the, the different steps that organizing a meeting um, and an event, um, they, what, what they have to do. And that allows them also to report accordingly. And we can share that also with our, um, uh, with our meeting and events organizers and, and, and uh, clients. So it's definitely part of our, of our plans to retrain the staff on the new technology that is available. Um, another good example was the launch of the hybrid, uh, hybrid meetings. Um, we had to retrain all our ME uh, staff to, uh, we did a, we did a, a deal with Zoom um, in order to introduce those hybrid meetings and we trained our entire ME staff, even for hotels that were closed because the staff was there available to, uh, to be trained um, in, in this new technology. So we, we strongly believe that when the, the business will be relaunched, our staff will be more technologic, uh, uh, te te technologically uh, driven and way more efficient towards our customers. Okay. Crucial element. Great. Carlotta, do you have any, any comments on the training element for Florence Convention Bureau? My, yes, as I said, we are working hard on future projects and um, of course we have changed also the way we work because we are all in smart working and uh, so uh, this is of course something we, ha we had to manage at the very beginning because we are a big team and we used to work well together. And now, yes, we are working on the future. We are setting everything because we want that as soon as we will be open again, we are ready to start and to grow again. So we are uh, working very hard on that. And at the same time, we are doing a lot of uh, training courses to be more and more efficient in this new way of working, which is uh, the smart working. And um, we are quite satisfied about that, I have to say. And Nick, the, in, in the exhibition world, how about the training? Approach to training. Well, I, I mean, from, from our point of view, for Mufi, you know, we're a kind of small association. So, you know, I guess similar to a convention bureau or, or many of your association members, you know, we're, I've been working remotely from London for 10 years, but, you know, and we have an office in Bogota, one in Hong Kong and, and Dubai, but the main staff are in Paris. And of course, we've had to adjust to working, you know, in these environments. But, but a huge part of what we do is meetings. We run about six or seven large meetings every right. year. And we've had to, you know, we've not been able to meet with our members. And that's a huge, you know, that's a huge challenge. Um, you know, I would just like to take this opportunity to say I'm very proud of the work that the UFI team has done in the last six months. You know, it's, it's in crises like these that associations, that members look to associations for leadership and for help. Um, and yeah, I'm really proud of the work we've done. As to managing the switch to digital, uh, it's ongoing. I mean, we have our own uh, Congress in a couple of weeks and it's, you know, we're very good at running normal events and this is our first digital event you know, coping with new platforms and, and all kinds of new technologies. So fingers crossed it goes well. Congratulations to ICA for, for this, you know, your great Congress. Uh, but we will have to change. We will have to adapt. We will have to learn new skills um, while supporting our staff, you know, in really challenging circumstances. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank our three panelists. Unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. We're even over our, the time slot, which was allotted to us. Um, so please, if you have any other questions, you can send them to us and we'll forward them to, to the different speakers. I'm sure they'll be, they'll be happy to come back. I want to take the opportunity to thank you, thank Carlotta, thank Remy, and thank Nick for being with us today and for your excellent presentations, which is a lot of food for thought about what we can do to what we've learned from the COVID crisis and how these different organizations in different sectors are preparing the future in the post-COVID world. So with that, I'd just like to say that we're going to take a break now, and after the break, we'll come back and we'll have a session which will be, um, which will be facilitated by my friend Attila Laszlo, which is going to talk about the Belvin, Belgian chapter of MPI's experience with virtual and hybrid networking and education. So thank you for your attendance. Thank Great you. to see you all. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to my, to the, my three panelists. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care. Ciao. And thank you. Thank you. Thank ciao, you. ciao. Thank you. A peace.